I started to realize, okay, I'm retarded. Meaning, don't follow me. Don't follow me because I'm a fallen man. I make mistakes. I'm going to screw up. And I, even though I have my be your best intentions in mind, I might be wrong. And so what do you do when you want that kind of certainty? Well, what were they doing? They were following me. So I had to ask myself, well, who am I following? Who am I accountable to? Who's my authority? And I knew that it couldn't be another guru. It couldn't be another, you know, trainer that I looked up to. There were guys that I referenced and I thought they were smart, but like, it goes beyond the information. It's more, it's the, it's the soul of it. Like, where am I leading these men's souls? Am I leading them towards damnation or salvation? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Extrospective Podcast with your host, Zach Villeneuve Snell. Today, I am joined by a gentleman known as Elliot Hulse, who is a YouTuber, podcaster, and coach who began posting YouTube videos back in 2007, making a name for himself in the online fitness and self-development world. Since then, his YouTube channels have garnered millions of subscribers and over half a billion views, as Elliot has shown incredible consistency and a work ethic to provide immense value to the men and women that follow him from across the globe. Elliot's story is one of continual questioning and personal evolution, which has reflected in the content that he's created, most recently discovering Christianity and what it means to be a follower of God. He's been on an incredible journey and it was a real honor to sit down and host him on the podcast, which has been going for less than a year. In this podcast, Elliot and I discuss his origin story, making money on the internet in the early 2000s, why his Yo Elliot video has gained millions of views every day, his views on marriage, masculinity, and God, and how we can turn the tide, building strong men against what he views as the degenerate modern society. This really was an honor and a privilege, and aside from the vanity metrics of having such an esteemed guest, it truly was a conversation of immense value. So without further ado, Elliot Hulse. Elliot Hulse, welcome to the Extrospective podcast. How are you doing? Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, man. I'm doing well. When I was doing my research for this podcast, I was genuinely moved by some of the comments I saw made across social media uh, across the years. And to start this episode off, I just want to read one of the comments that I found, which hopefully gives the listeners uh, an, a sense of, of who you are. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read this comment out to, to head the podcast. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it says yeah. this, um, dealing this, with the suicide of my older brother in 2012, Elliot literally saved my life. I got to love life again through his views on emotions, bioenergetic, bioenergetics, and how to grow through adversities. He got me into training from being a cute computer game addict. He showed me how to trust myself and let go of other people's expectations. He showed me the path towards real self-confidence. He gave me the courage to chase my dreams and listen to my heart and not to society. He was my greatest and most meaningful mentor and I never talked to him. He is the reason why I do what I do today and why I'll dedicate my life to inspire other people instead of working a regular job. More than my parents, my teachers and my friends, this man changed my life. What do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, just, I just make videos, man. I just share my opinion. Some people say I talk shit. Whatever. I make videos and whatever happens out there is up to, up to how it's received, right? And so some people, uh, nice things happened and that's nice. Some people have some not so nice things to say about me, but either way, I'm just neutral. I think it's a, it's a great approach, and that's something I definitely recognized when I was doing the research on this, kind of following you, and as I followed you, it's just the, the sort of raw authenticity of like, yeah, this is what I am, this is what I believe, and make of that what you will. And I think more people need to do that rather than catering to what their audience might want. You know, you're sort of really trying, you have a heart for the truth, I suppose, and that's that's really important. Um, and I'm sure I could find loads of examples exactly like that. Um, but as I've done my research, I've seen so many different evolutions of Elliot Holst. You know, there's been so many different phases. There's even been a, a documentary made about you on all these different stages. And um, to, to ground this podcast in, in you, first of all, and your journey, <laughs> and then into what you believe now, um, how would you sum up who Elliot Holst is today? 
Uh, I am a father. I am a husband. I am a coach. I am a strong man. Uh, I'm, I'm just me, man. Try not to complicate it too much. That was a question I wrestled with a bunch when I was a youth. Always wondered who I was, what I am. I grew up uh, in uh, Long Island, New York, suburb of New York City. And everybody knew what they were, right? Like there was Jamaicans and Haitians and Puerto Ricans and Irish and Jews and Italians. And then there was me. And so like I mixed. So people would always ask me, like, what are you? What are you? What are you? What are you? And so it was like a question that I wrestled with quite a bit. It was like an existential crisis at a young age. Like, well, what am I? Um, so I wrestled with it enough so that I've, so much so that I've come to, like, I'm old enough now that I'm like, I'm whatever I am. I'm just me. I'm, it doesn't, like, I don't even really think about it that much anymore, man. I just do what my dad, my dad's been a great mentor to me in my whole life. And, you know, he says, just, doesn't all that stuff, man, we, <laughs> These are first world problems, this whole idea of like, what am I and who am I and impact and, you know, am I changing the world? It's, it's really all uh, narcissistic bullshit. Um, I'm a dude who has a, good, a big mouth that got lucky with YouTube because I started making videos when it first came out. If I made YouTube videos today, if I started today, no video, comments like that wouldn't pop up because there's a thousand people that are doing what I do now so i was just a lucky guy that has a big mouth made a bunch of videos and you know here i am still hustling struggling trying to raise my family that's it and that's something that i found so admirable is just how long you've been in the game and you say you know you started youtube back in the old days in 2007 when it was just pick up a camera and start filming people tire flipping over tires and training these men in a more outdoor environment um but yeah, who, yeah. who was elliot holst before all of that kicked off what were you like as a child uh, they told me I had ADHD when I was in fourth grade. And so they gave me, actually it wasn't even ADHD at the time. It was ADD. I had attention deficit disorder. All right. And, uh, so I went on Ritalin. I was like one of the experimental pharmaceutical guinea pigs for like, you know, this new drug that's going to make boys act a little less boyish. And so, um, that was me again. When I was a kid, I was like, I, I was I was the strongest, I was the fastest, I was most athletic, you know, I was like the team captain, but when it came to school, like they couldn't shut me up. Like I didn't want to sit down and listen to this middle-aged biatch talking to a bunch of kids and trying to, you know, impose her will on me. I'm a willful person, so didn't fly very well, so they drugged me when I was real young, and then so I got resentful. And I was like, all right, you can drug me, well, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to be what you say I am. And so I got into a lot of trouble as a result and was in and out with the law when I was, you know, in middle school and stuff, you know, stealing stuff, robbing things, doing drugs, drinking, you know, like a lot of the stuff that guys get into, like when they're later in high school or college, I got that all of my, out of my system by the time I was 15. I did that all between like 12 and 15. By the time I turned 15, I met my wife. <laughs> I met my wife and I started lifting the barbell. And between uh, meeting the woman that would become, eventually become my wife and discovering the tool by which I would build my life, which is the barbell and the gym, um, my whole focus shifted and changed. And I dedicated my life to, you know, being, becoming a husband and a father. We've been married 20 years. And, uh, and I knew that I wanted to teach men how to be strong using a barbell. And so, um, I always started strength camp, you know, at the back of my van, training people with trash in the parks. And, um, you know, still to some degree doing the same thing. It's just, I guess that's, it was the plan for me. Your dad said on your podcast that he values freedom above all else and doesn't like to be controlled and that it's just his nature. And obviously that's something that would, would have been passed down. And you were, as you've just described, diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. I think that's actually quite on the rise at the moment, supposedly. But I think it's because, like, well, I won't, I won't impose what I think. What do you think that the reason for that is? Because I, I see boys who are, like yourself, kind of maybe not so suited towards the classroom. Previous entrepreneurs who have been on the podcast have said very similar things. That they just needed, they didn't like that imposition. They wanted to be outside, being physical, 
being being young boys turning into men, right? So what, what do you right. make of that whole that whole thing? Like, I guess it's a bit well, of a I'm no scientist, but I've watched some videos from scientists who say that uh, it's all made up. It was fake. It was is a whole political ploy. Um, we live in a gynocentric world that uh, that feminizes men and wants to turn women into men, and we see it. I mean, it's reached its extreme with the transgender thing, thing. But uh, but on a cultural basis. In order to level the playing field, the, they created a Department of Education where they began training children all in the same manner, which is more suited to girls. Girls learn by speaking and listening. They're verbal. They're more verbal creatures than we are. Not to say that we're not, and they are. There's there's crossover, but generally speaking, women learn by listening and speaking. That's why they're so chatty. A bunch of girls get together, they just chat, 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 chat. After guys speak for a couple of minutes, we're like, all right, well, what are we going to do? What are we doing? That's why guys go to the gym and women go for coffee. And so the education system is set up, and in more so today, even back then, because you know, they get rid of, they've gotten rid of phys ed, they get rid of sports, they get rid of physical activity, and it's all designed for sitting down, talking, and listening. Of course, girls do really well. But at the same time, it is, uh, it's an attack against the masculine urge to do shit. And so as a young man and as a man, like we learn with our hands, then learn by doing things. And so uh, the whole idea that there's attention deficit is basically a repackaged name for being a little too masculine as a boy. You're a little, you're a little too, you're a little too um, boyish. We need you to shut, sit down, shut up and act a little bit more like a girl. And so, um, Thus, they created a disease and, uh, and and pills to go along with it. I suppose it's one of those things where you could probably pick a fine number of cases that might be deemed as that, but there's so many other things that are being lumped into that category that's kind of ruining the definition, as, as with like depression and anxiety as well, I guess. Like just mental health in general is so right. trivialized to the point where everyone seems to have something in this modern world, and that doesn't invalidate the you know the small percentage of people that genuinely do have like the things that are going on but i mm -hmm. suppose like <laughs> there's just been an epidemic of people seeing that and the victim of culture and all this stuff that you were able to kind of escape from and and you found the gym and that was your kind of way out and so yeah. what, what did the gym sort of mean to you as you were coming out and as you were sort of setting up strength camp and things like what what was your kind of life like then uh, around that kind of time period uh, around the age of 14, 14, yeah. 15. Yeah, onwards, uh, yeah, yeah. Things started changing for me. Um, I, you know, once again, I didn't do well in school, but mostly because I just didn't want to, quite frankly. Once I, 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 did, I spent one year in graduate school and I got 4.0 because we were studying exercise physiology. It was like, oh, I actually like this. So it's not that I had a, I couldn't do well in school. I just didn't care. I didn't want to. Um, so I never really did. I never really got good grades. When my uncle introduced me to the barbell and I started lifting, it was the first time that I saw. Well, first of all, I made an effort to put in to get a return on my effort, a return on my investment. And so very quickly, I mean, it wasn't but a couple of weeks after you know doing a bunch of squats, deadlifts, and bench presses, and 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 things like that, that uh, I looked in the mirror. And I was like, holy cow, I'm growing and there's muscles popping up all over the place. I'm addicted to this because it was a sense of achievement more than anything, you know? But, you know, I'm not knocking, uh, you know, I'm just talking shit, but like, you know, there are they're, they're young men that did really well in school, right? They would study. I had friends like that. They would actually study and they'd sit down and then they would, they would pass their tests and they'd do well. I never had that experience. So I never had the experience of putting in effort and then getting something out until I started lifting. And then I was like, oh, wow. I put in effort, I get something out. And so it kind of like, maybe I was a little slow, right? But eventually at that point I realized, huh, my, my results in life are concomitant with the efforts I put in. And so it taught, and from that point on, I started reading books. I started, I wanted to learn because I recognized, I learned how it worked, but I was reading like bodybuilding books. I was reading like powerlifting books. I was reading, you know, it was all about to me, it was it had everything to do with like growing muscle and getting stronger. It, it's really great that you've just said that because I literally shared on my Instagram story yesterday me reading a book about psychology. Uh, I literally just put a little text next to it, like you don't 
you don't dislike reading. You just haven't found the books that you're interested in yet. And I think yes. it's because the, the school as a system, as you've said, is like a is imposition on things that you don't see how you're going to learn um, the benefit from it. Whereas you are able to have that feedback loop with the feedback loop with the gym, seeing, OK, put in efforts, get results. And then reading the books, you actually, oh, I'm actually interested in this stuff. And I think that's what we need to do more with young people is like inspire them and actually give them choices because people are different. Right. You, you picked up on the, the very obvious difference between men and women, which is like the the one of the most psychologically studied things is like men are more interested in things, women are more interested in people generally. Right. So we need, we need to allow space for that, right? And that's, that's exactly what, what you're just referring to. Yeah. Sure. Um, so what was it that, that you took on from doing all this stuff to then actually wanting to share it online? Because <laughs> I appreciate back in, back in 2007, it wasn't exactly the same appeal of monetization and making money and advertising and growing yeah. a personal brand. None of these things really existed back in 2007. So what was it that inspired you to, to go and share online? Well, in 1994, my uncle became a personal trainer before there were personal trainers, right? It really wasn't even a thing. He was like one of the first. He got like one of the first certifications. And he started training me and my brothers in the basement, but he made a job for himself. It was the first time I ever heard of somebody working for themselves also. So he was a personal trainer working for himself. And I'm like 13 years old. I'm like, whoa, that looks, that sounds pretty cool. He's like, yeah, I make up my own schedule. I hire, people hire me. I meet them at the gym and they pay me to show them how to work out. And, you know, I help them lose weight and build muscle. I was like, wow, it's a thing. You can work for yourself and do it by showing people how to lift. And he's like, yeah. So I knew in that moment, I was like, that's what I'm doing. So there was no other, I had no other, no other option in my mind is like, I'm going to work for myself, teaching people how to get stronger. And uh, that was 1994. You know, of course, I didn't know how that was going to pan out. I just saw my uncle and he was my inspiration. Um, in, two, in 1999, 1990, between uh, 98 and 99, um, the internet started coming out. And we had like AOL. This is like when you had to like, log in through your phone and it would make all that noise. And like, if you had one phone line in the house, like nobody could be on the phone because you're on the internet. And so it was like, then at, at that point, I had a friend who I played college football with who his name is Richie and he always knew how to make money. I think his parents named him Rich and he just decided, well, I'm going to be rich. He always had some kind of hustle, man. Like he would be like selling tickets to like parties or like he was just, he'd hustle. He just hustle. He just make money. And so he liked nice things. One day I went over to his house. He's like, yo, check this out. And he logs into the internet, screech, gets on the internet, and he goes into an AOL chat room. And he's like, check this out. This guy just sent me 500 bucks. I'm like, what the hell? How is, why did he send you 500 bucks? He's like, I give them bidding tips. And then PayPal came out, right? And he's like, yeah, he opened up his PayPal came out, his PayPal account. And he was like, yeah, look, I have, he had like $30,000 in there. I was like, we're like, you know, we're like 20. I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, how is this possible? And in that moment, I was like, I'm going to use the internet. Because he was like in his bedroom, sitting on his bed. Or actually, was, we didn't even have laptops back then. It was on his desk. It was like a big computer. And he was showing me. And, I, and so then like another bell went off in my head. So it was like, I, I know I'm going to teach people to grow stronger. And I'm going to work for myself. And then when I saw him do that, I was like, there's something to this internet thing. I mean, this was like back before, like Napster days, like when in order to file share, like all the information that you guys get on YouTube and stuff now, it was like file sharing through Napster. And so it was not even like, it wasn't even like in my mind that there would be a YouTube or something. I had no idea that that would, that would even exist. But I knew that I could use the internet to get clients. And so that's what I did. As soon as I, I, I started training people, I learned internet marketing. I, I paid like $6,000 for this course that, that I couldn't even afford. And I went up and I learned about how to create this. There's a brand new technology that this guy created. Like he branded it called a squeeze page. This is Matt Basak back in like 2005. Everybody goes to landing pages now and puts their email address in. But he came up with this. He's like the guy who's like, this is what you got to do if you want to build a business using the internet and you, and so me, I wasn't thinking making, making money on the internet. I was like, how do I get clients? So you send them to a page. There's nothing there except give me your email address. And you follow up with emails in your emails. You put a link to your sales page. 
that sales page is what they read and then they buy stuff. So I created that and I started getting clients. I got a lot of a lot of clients in my in my city, in St. Pete. In St. Pete was like it was it was podunk, like backwards, backwater Florida town. Now it's like popping in big city. But back then it was like there was no competition. There was nobody. I was working in a I was working at a commercial gym, but I was building this up on the side because I was like, I, eventually I'm gonna leave here. And so I started I started getting my own clients, and then eventually I left. At the same time, because I was already like studying internet marketing stuff, and like you know, I, I had that guy Matt Basak. He talked about how to sell eBooks. He was like, now that you have all these people on your list, not everyone's going to buy. They're not. They may not become your client. But for those who maybe they won't become your client, you can you can sell them your workouts on a PDF. I didn't even know what a PDF was back then. But it's like you make a document with the workouts, put some pictures and stuff, and you could sell it to them for like $30 or whatever. And so I started selling that. And I mean, I can keep going on and on, but like that's where I started. That's how it began. There's something so innovative about that in a world where people are just exploring these technologies and you're seeing the opportunities and piecing them together. You know, you said you, you've, you've seen this bit here, you've seen this bit here, and all these light bulbs are kind of popping off. What do you think it is about you and your temperament that differentiates you from other people who might not have been so like, entrepreneurial or creative in that way? Because obviously this stuff is like just coming out and you're kind of looking for that stuff. Uh, it was my desire to live life on my terms. That's really what it was, you know? So I knew what I wanted. I, and so I was looking, I had my antennas up for like, okay, how can I make this happen? Right. So when I saw my uncle training people and working for himself and helping people the way I wanted to help them, right? Because business is always an exchange of value. And so I was like, yeah, like that appealed to my heart. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I, I can do that. I want to do that. Then when the internet came and I saw my friend like making money at home, I was like, oh, well, that that just kind of that went into the same bucket of autonomy. Okay, wow, I can actually do it through this new technology. And I was, I don't want to say I was late with the internet, but he was really early. I didn't, I didn't even have an email address. And so I was like, okay, I didn't know exactly how I'd do it. My first website I, I created was called, it was called, um, what was it? It was like Primal, Primal Edge or something like that. And I was, I was, I coded it all myself. I would like steal codes from other websites. And then I learned HTML just by watching what other, how other people like, their websites were built. Now they have like all different types of stuff to build websites. But back then, like they had to code websites. So I taught myself how to code websites. It's fucking crazy. Um, but all with the desire, you know, you asked me like what made me different was that I knew, I guess because of my rebellious nature against the institutional, you know, the institution of the education, I, I started hating authority as a result of the drugs that they were putting me on. So I became very distrustful of doctors, became very distrustful of my teachers. I was like, these people are like, I, I didn't blame myself, I blamed them. I was like, they're wrong, there's something wrong with them. And so as a result, I had like a chip on my shoulder. So I was like, anything to get from underneath someone else's authority. I was a rebellious kid and also too, like with my dad, like I always fought with my dad. Like I just, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but I'm just telling you because I see the folly in it now and I see where it's hurt me in my life as well. Like not being humble and I've had to be humbled as a result, but it was always a desire to have to be autonomous that and anything that kind of like and then and then when it came to gyms i saw there was a guy that was making youtube videos who was like training people in his garage and i was like huh i don't even have to train people at the gym like i can I, I, everything was more it was all about me like how can i eliminate as many people as possible even my business today like i had a, I had a call with one of my uh, one of my employees He's talking about how to like build this extra team and stuff. I'm like, nah, I don't want to be around people. I want, I want to be as autonomous as possible, as light as possible. Like, you know, you know, like these guys, like the, the soldiers that would like be light on their feet, like just give me, or like these guys that go hiking, they have like, uh, I forget what they call it, ultra light hikers. Like that appeals to me. Like the guys who are minimalist, like they wear, like they got to, they, they can't have like more than 10 pounds of stuff on them. And they figure it out as they go along. Like I don't know. I think that's just my nature. There's there's so many layers to that, isn't there? Like that applies in so many ways. Like like mentally, literally, physically as well. Like pursuing minimalism as opposed to like the material desires of the world. But um, I find it interesting that 
you have that rebellious nature, but so many, so many young men kind of spiral off into a negative, but you were able to use that and fuel it as a positive. And I think that's, that's hopefully an inspiration for, for people who might be listening to this, who might feel themselves, they might be later on in the journey, but they might still feel like they're being trapped in this system and that, that they want to get a corporate job and work and retire and whatever. But actually, you know, if you explore the opportunities and pursue what you are passionate about, there hopefully will be things out that kind of, to kind of link up as, as you go along. Um, the YouTube obviously evolves. And for those who don't know, kind of you start to gain subscribers, gain followers and stuff. Um, one of the key moments, I think, was probably the transition to Yo Elliot or Yo Elliot. I don't know um, how, how, you, how you call it. But um, how did it transfer from talking about gym stuff, doing gym instruction, getting people together to you literally what you became known for, I suppose, is picking up the camera and just talking your mind. Like, what? Was, how did that kind of spark spark off in your mind? It was easy. <laughs> it was <laughs> easy. I didn't have to make content. All I did was answer the questions that people were sending me. And whatever said, whatever questions they were sending me, if I had an opinion about it, because quite frankly, that's just what I was doing, just giving my opinion. I mean, I have, I read a lot and I study a lot and I knew a lot, especially about fitness and things of that nature. But um, I, I had no agenda. That's another thing, another like kind of, a good and a bad thing, but like my rebelliousness against authority is also a rebellion against order and structure. And so I'm sort of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of guy. And it's hurt me too. Like, I'm not saying, I don't want everybody to listen to this and be like, oh, I need to be like that because Elliot was successful as a result. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like there are things that suck about me and that I failed at as a result of this. But, and YouTube was one of them at some, at a certain point, like I got passed over because it was like, I was just like, can't keep doing the same old thing that I was doing when it was working in the beginning. I was lucky. And so Yo Elliot was really just a way for me to make a shit ton of content displaying my charisma without having to work very hard. People sent questions and I would literally just, I, and this was like, you know, when you had flip cams or like, you know, I had to put a camera, I didn't, you didn't have them on the phones. Um, and I would just read the questions and I just spit off my opinion and give my answer. And so I could, I could make like 20 of those a week if I wanted. Do you think like if you had been 10 years younger, so if all this had happened like around now, obviously you, you mentioned that, that 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 kind of style of content might not pick up on YouTube as much, but do you think the way that the culture has moved would also mean that that wouldn't be like socially acceptable? Because obviously like there's a lot of thing, talk, talk about cancel culture and politi political um, speak and you know with, with the way that people get held to account for things that they've said in the past even if they don't think those beliefs anymore and i'm sure you can probably look back as well and and you can look back and reflect and go okay i don't believe that anymore oh, yeah. or my opinions change on that of course because you've had this this huge evolution but yeah what what, what are your thoughts you, what's the question if i were to start today yeah like do what do you think that the content that you you made back then would get you in trouble <laughs> if it was out now basically Get me in trouble? No, I was pretty innocuous back then. What I say now gets me in trouble. <laughs> sure, okay. Yeah. No, I'm much more of a troublemaker as I've gotten older because I'm more I'm more divisive now. But back then, no, I was the minute I started venturing off into um, being eccentric, that's when I started getting uh, backlash. But it was very easy for me to just I just as long as I stuck to fitness questions. Um, there was nobody to challenge me. That was another thing too. It was like, there was nobody to challenge me. It was like, I was the only guy on the internet. It was like, what are you, where else are you going to go? Belly has said it. It's got to be true because I'm the only guy here. <laughs> there were other channels. But um, today that wouldn't fly so much because anything that you say now, everybody can go back and like, well, that's not what these 10 guys said. Well, that's not what this Google search gave me or this study said. And so, you know, I, in, 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 a, in a way, I just got away with saying whatever I wanted to because, you know, and here's the thing too. I understood this as well. People weren't watching. Okay. They don't, get me, don't get me wrong. Like I knew what I was talking about. There are a lot of things that I'm, I'm not a dumb guy, but I'm not a genius. But a part of the reason why people were watching me is because I was good looking and charismatic. And so I knew it was more about just getting in front of the camera and being charismatic was going to get me the attention that I needed to, you know, make YouTube money. Did that and response? So was, sorry, sorry. I'm just saying, you know, it was, it was. I was an entertainer, you know, and I didn't. I didn't let that. I didn't let that. Uh, I wouldn't fool myself as I was to anything else than that as well. Also, like I realized that, like, you know, people, if I was, if it was another guy, 
those maybe not as good looking and charismatic saying the same things that I was saying, um, they probably wouldn't have gotten as much traction. I mean, that, that self-awareness is really important, is it? And at, at the time, did you ever feel like the the weight of responsibility? And you can, you know, Cause you can literally see the views on the videos and the comments and things. And like, you know, you, there are a lot of young men, impressionable men following you. So did that ever play on your mind or did you kind of thrive in confidence that what you were sharing was the right thing? Well, I, I believe what I say, but I know I'm not always right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I'm convinced, when I, when I speak, I have conviction, but that's why I change my mind sometimes. I mean, it, the problem with being around someone who has conviction is that I'm very convincing. But then if I, but then if a year later from now, I change my mind, well, it's like, well, it's not my fault. Like I, I genuinely believe that, like trying to help you, but I changed my mind. And then that really, that pisses people <laughs> That pisses people off. Um, I don't remember what your question was. was like, it, like, it. did the responsibility weigh on your mind with, you know? Oh, responsibility. Yeah. So that weighed very heavily on my mind because at a certain point I realized what was happening. And I was like, these, there's a lot of young men that are hanging on every word I have to say. And I knew that if I was going to lead them, I had to lead them in the right direction. Otherwise, I, had, I just had this sense of responsibility that if you're going to be following not what I say, but you're actually following me, then I had better not be leading you off a cliff. So I got to get myself right. And this is when my whole idea about authority, this is when I grew up. And so I could say this is probably after around 2018, between 2017, 2018, I started to realize, okay, I'm retarded. Meaning don't follow me. Don't follow me because I'm a fallen man. I make mistakes. I'm going to screw up. And I, even though I have my be your best intentions in mind, I might be wrong. And so what do you do when you want that kind of certainty? Well, what were they doing? They were following me. So I had to ask myself, well, who am I following? Who am I accountable to? Who's my authority? And I knew that it couldn't be another guru. It couldn't be another, you know, trainer that I looked up to. There were guys that I referenced and I thought they were smart, but like, it goes beyond the information. It's more, it's the, it's the soul of it. Like, where am I leading these men's souls? Am I leading them towards damnation or salvation? It was really the, the ultimate end of each of our lives is the end itself, which is death. And I had to explore that as well. Like, am I filling these guys' minds and their hearts with things that will profit them, not just in this life, but in the next? Because I believed in, I believe in the soul. I believe in spirit. I believe in God. I wasn't sure in what way. I didn't know what religion. I didn't know who to follow, but I was like, but I do believe that these men have souls and I'm feeding their souls. It had better be in the right way. It had better be positive. And, I, and if there's a heaven and there's a hell, I would have to answer for the damnation of millions of souls. <laughs> and that weighed on me. Didn't matter, to, you know, because... Worldly success comes and goes, and I can't, you can't blame me for it, right? Can't blame me. But for the, 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 the posture of your heart, which you, which you believe who you are as a human being and, and where you're going and what your, your purpose is, that's totally different. And so that's a part of the reason why, and around the time that I started my, or I don't even want to say my journey, but Christ started calling me back into his fold. And it was the last thing that I was even thinking about. And so, but it made logical sense to me at a certain point. Of course, there was the Holy Ghost and the Spirit moving me, and I take no credit for it at all. But then logically, I had to equivocate it with, okay, if Christ is my leader, and God is the end, and if I'm genuine about going in that direction and men are following me, I don't want to, I, my hands are clean because that's the ultimate end in itself. You're going to die. And so whether this is true or not, whether it's, I'm right or not, I'm, I feel much more, I, I, my sense of responsibility is satisfied knowing that at least if there is a heaven and hell, that my intention was to lead these guys' souls to hell. Because we're all going to die. So, to heaven, sorry, not to heaven. <laughs> to heaven. And we're all going to die. And I would hate to meet you guys in hell 
and we burn it up next to each other, and you guys point your finger at me. You told me this. You didn't tell me that. I'll take that gamble. I'll take that. I'll take that gamble. That if 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 Christianity is wrong and there is no God and there is no heaven, fine. But if there is, I'd much rather be in a position to be sitting in heaven with you guys and saying, and y'all then really thanking me. See all that, those emails that you read before, those messages. Oh, Elliot changed my life. That means shit to me. I don't know if you noticed when you were reading it. I was dozing off. I was like, ah, blah 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 blah. But if we get to heaven together. And you say, hey, Elliot, thank you. Now that needs something, at least in the eyes of God. That reminds me very much of actually literally just this Sunday, uh, yesterday, Sunday morning sermon, um, part of the, the preacher, he grabbed a long, long piece of uh, rope and he said, this is your life. And, you know, it's kind of one centimeter at the end of the rope. He's like, everything that you do in this small one centimeter is going to then continue in eternity. And the, obviously his illustration is like, that's what you should be postured towards, like firstly yourself yeah. and also the where you're leading other people with your opinions and your views and what you're basing your worldview on, you know, how you're spending your time. And I found that deeply powerful. And I, I find it interesting how much of a parallel there is between hearing that yesterday yeah. and exactly what you've sort of described um, with saying that there. Um, so you, would you say, because obviously it was in response to me asking you know, the, the responsibility, does the responsibility weigh down? And then that was how you transitioned towards like faith and these more philosophical, good, deep questions. But was there anything else that led you on that kind of reflection of, of something more? Because I think it's, it was a kind of a trend that you're kind of looking into spirituality and stuff in general in sort of the years building up. So would you say there were any other factors in, in coming to Christ and kind of discovering this? Well, yeah, you know, first of all, I always give thanks to my baptismal graces. My parents baptized me as a child. Now I understand why Catholics do infant baptism, because there's a grace that car that the Holy Spirit is with that child, no matter where they go. If they veer off, that per that child has been infused with the Holy Spirit and then confirmed later on. Um, so I just, I say it's grace, by grace alone. But... I mentioned earlier that I've always been a seeker. I've, you know, like it's kind of, it's a millennial thing. And I'm kind of like, I think of myself as like an old millennial, but like this whole question of like, who am I? And like, what, what am I going to do in this world? And how am I going to make a change? And like, that's like our parents, my parents didn't think that. My parents were like, you just got to work and feed your children and go to church and shut up. And like their parents, their parents, like it was just like, yo, you just live your life. What are you, what are you thinking about? Like these philosophical questions, like, like I said, they're first world problems. Um, and, it, and it's not just first world problems, it's generational. Like it's kind of a new age way of thinking. We were, back then, we were, it, our interest was more in, before this new age way of thinking, which is really narcissism. The, the way people would think is more communal. Like where do I fit in with the family? Where do I fit in with my community? You see what I'm saying? It was more grounded. Now it's like, you know, with the internet and everything, it's like, how am I going to change the world? Millions of people are going to, you know, and so I got caught up in that also. But uh, the question about like being open to spirit or being open to God and, you know, walking the spiritual path from the time I was a teenager, I was doing that because of that question, who am I? I was asking myself, who am I, who am I? What am I here for? What am I actually, what is this actually really about? Like it was a weird thing for a 12 year old to be asking themselves, but it was imprinted in my heart. So it's not like I was ever an atheist or, or I don't know if the word agnostic, but like I've always believed in the God of the Bible, but it was mixed up with all kinds of different stuff and new age stuff and philosophies and things that were wrong ultimately turned out to be that were distractions and that, you know, lead astray. I was led astray. I allow myself to be led astray. But then ultimately when it was time to come home, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to become Catholic. I didn't know I was Catholic, but like at some point God, laid it on my heart that it was time to confess your sins and repent and return home. And I even resisted a little bit. I was like, I don't know anything about that. Like, and I'm not sure I want that, but I'm going to go with it. 
Yeah, greatest thing that has ever happened. And so, man, yeah, here I am. It's just been the journey the whole way through. And I'm back home, really. That's what it is. Like, I just came full circle. Yeah, fantastic. And thinking about being on a journey and kind of going full circle and, and coming back home, as you've just described there, um, one of the things that I find interesting about kind of doing the research and maybe like the last five, ten to, five to ten years on, on your kind of journey is how you spent a period of time really leaning into like the how men should lean into their feminine side and you know the tenderness and beating out the aggression and then how it kind of went the other way with maybe like more red pill stuff and then it's kind of now integrating that together and so I did a bit of like reading on you know what it means to be an integrated man and it's quite funny because then I googled on YouTube integrated man and the top video was like two years ago from yourself I was like of course like that's such a, a classic thing that you've been on this journey you've seen the, the masculine and the feminine and you've been able to integrate it and I suppose that's also <laughs> along the same uh line as the as the coming to Christ and stuff so I just wanted to ask like today what what does it mean to you to be uh, an integrated man? Wow. Yeah, it's all of that. And so it's a, it's being full spectrum. And I was fascinated to have discovered at a time of crisis for me was what was happening in my life that I discovered work of Carl Jung, quite frankly. But it was a neo-Jungian uh, by the name of Robert Moore and the mythopoetic men's movement that was led by another guy named Robert Bly, and I started learning about masculine initiation, uh, as well as the um, the archetypal man, the quadrated psyche, according to Jung, which is you know is the cross, right? It's ultimately the cross, the quadrated psyche. So the the the, the liberating or the uh, the ascendant, and also the the horizontal, the earthly aspect of being a man, spirit and earthly. But those qua that quadrated psyche, you see, it's an archetype that you see everywhere just watch like for i'll tell you what the, the the mythological language around it but then i'll point out like where you see it everywhere so to be the fully integrated man is to be king warrior magician lover there are four aspects of a man he's thinking feeling being or doing that's all it is i mean and and i say that's all it is but that's deep like you can like robert robert moore you can spend a lifetime digging into any one of those quadrants right Thinking, feeling, being, doing. We, we, we can't, we're not anything else. In other words, you can't be doing anything else because then you're doing. You can't be thinking of yourself in any other way or you're thinking. And then there's feeling. But the one that really is most existential is, is being, right? And that's, that's the Imago Dei. That's the image of God. That's the King, Christ the King, Jesus Christ, being itself. It's the King aspect is... I mean, if you notice a king crown, it's always pointing up. It's about the existential. And so we're spiritual, we're mental, we're emotional, we're physical. There you go. You got those four again there, right? So the fully integrated man is spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, right? The crown, the mind, the heart, and the balls. Fully integrated. That's the integrated man. So it's, uh, it's, that, that makes it tangible, Right? You're thinking, feeling, being, doing. Spirit, mind, heart, balls, sex, body. Um, king, warrior, magician, lover. The quadrated psyche. So, but then the question becomes, how do you integrate this? And so it's layers. And whether you, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you see it or not, whether you're conscious of it or not, we're going on a layered journey as a man. I mean, there are people who, who study this archetype. There's a really good book I mentioned to a friend yesterday called The, um, the, the Amazing Development of Men um, by Alison Armstrong. And she talks about like the, the, the phases of being a man. When you're a boy, you're a, you're a page. Like, you know, you're running around with your fake sword and you're playing war and you, you, know, you look up to like the teenage boys because they're actually on the horses riding. The teenage boys are the older boys. Now they're, they're knights. Right, they're little warriors. Like you know, they're playing. Well, if in our realm, like you're playing football. Like I remember being a page, watching my uncle, my cousin play football. He had like the shiny helmets on. They come out on Saturdays at the game field, which was across the street from my house, football field. They was smash the, the the 
the band would play and they would run out, they'd rip through the banner and then their helmets are smashed. It was like, whoa, that's when you get to be uh, like a young, like a young warrior, right? A young knight, that's what they should call it, a knight. And then as you grow older, you become a warrior, right? Like, you know, you're probably at a stage where you're, you're hustling, trying to build your own business, you know, you're doing your podcast, you know, trying to make that money, trying to like, you know, be impressive to other men and to women as well and like make your place in the world. Like, so now you're in warrior stage where it's like grinding every day. You're just fighting for your place in the world. And then you get to be a late warrior. And of course, I'm not following the King Warrior Magician thing, but I'm just showing you how this all happens in layers but use a different language you can use. Then there's late warrior. And late warrior is like when you made it, it's like, whoa, I'm here. I did it. I've got some money in the bank. Maybe you have a wife at this point. And you know, you, maybe you have a, a house with a mortgage and you're like, all right, I got it. Then you start asking yourself, what is this all really about? And then you go into a catabasis. You go into a mid, you, they call it a midlife crisis because they don't understand it. But it is a, but it's a going down so that you can arise again. And that the only, the only way you become a king is if there's a death. There's no king without a sacrifice. So that that late warrior has to go into a into a tunnel. He has to go into a downward spiral where he purges all the things he collected from his er, the early part of his life that no longer serve the royalty that he's headed towards, the, the king that he's going to become. And so. Uh, you could call that a catabasis. You could call it a midlife crisis. You could, and for me, it wasn't midlife. It was I was thirty six. But you can. But these are patterns. I can talk. I can talk all day. But twelve year patterns or twelve year patterns where these are predictable patterns that you can see happen. Thirty six. That was at the peak of the peak of the thing. And so at twenty four, I had the same experience. And at, like I told you, I met my wife when I was 14, 12. That's when I was getting into trouble. But you go into a catabasis. You go down, you and that's called. You could call it shadow work. Also, there's a time for shadow work. I think a part of the problem with having too much information in our culture is that like young men that are like, you're in a stage that you're not, you shouldn't be doing shadow work yet. You should be fighting. Like you come back from war and then you do shadow work. But a lot of these you know young pussies who are like, oh, I gotta like self care. I gotta take care of my wounds. It's like no, no, you 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 don't lick your wounds until you go to war. You haven't gone to war yet, you're still, you still got milk in your teeth. So you gotta go fight. You gotta get really wounded out there. And then those like, those wounds really start showing themselves to you. They're magnified when you're in battle. A lot of these guys who think that they're, you know, that they're overcoming things and you're like, you're 21, bro. Like, just go work. Then you go down and you, and that's when you do, you, after you, you, you peaked, that's when you do shadow work. And then you arise as a king, and there's a whole association with that. And the final stage is elder. The point of me saying that is that this the idea of being a fully integrated man is layers, it's journey, it's experience, it's awareness. It's happening whether we consciously take hold of the process or not. Being conscious of it is helpful because then you, can, you don't freak out when you see certain things happening. And now I mentor men, so if I see where they're at, usually based on their age, you can tell what phase they're going to be in. It's easy to say, hey, look, I got the map. You, right now, it's a dark spot. Don't worry about it. It's going to clear up in about three years. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. Put your head down. Don't overthink it. Anyway. It's, it's interesting. No, no, it's, it's, just, it's fantastic the way you've been able to illustrate that. And it's, re it's really speaking to me. And I think... In a, in a culture, as you've mentioned at the beginning, that is potentially a bit more gynocentric and going in the way of um, progressive values and kind of more extreme evolutions of feminism is really trying to like tread out this deep archetypal thing which has kind of been passed down from generation to generation. And there's a reason why, I mean, even me just hearing that now is kind of feeling kind of riled up. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm on this like on this journey. And like, do you think that part of the reason why men are kind of uh, and people in general are kind of trying to bash this down. It's because we live in a in a society which is very like instant gratification, everything now and everything me centric. But there's no appreciation that what you've just said is a very clear journey over a man's life. That I can't achieve elder status by listening to you here, doing a bit of self development, and suddenly I've made it. Like it's it's very much a gradual, progressive journey of you know maybe heartbreak, maybe financial loss, maybe grief these things yes. that they make us and then 
we have to be, you know, resolve that trauma and become a peace. And then it's only at that stage that we can bring people underneath us and they'll go through those things and we can help them and guide them along that way. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, a part of the issue that we have here, though, too, is that we live in the... I'm going to say this, you know, colloquially, but we live in a fake world, meaning like everything's in the clouds. Even the work that I do, and I, and I guess you do as well, like it's all, we're staring at a freaking screen with bits on it. And we're like, sh we're shuffling, we're shuffling fuzz, just clouds. We literally work in the clouds. We're not actually doing anything. Uh, and so you mentioned gynocentrism. Most of our, what we experience as resistance and trauma is basically social bullshit. Oh, someone said something mean to me. Someone didn't like me. Oh, I didn't get a, I didn't get a lot of views on this video. Or you see what I'm saying? It's not real stuff. Like, oh, um, my brother fell off the horse today, and I had to, I had to carry him back home five miles on my back. You know what I'm saying? It's not real stuff. Oh, wow! Like the, the, all the hay arrived today, and now we have to fill the barn. Like that stuff that like is. I, I want to say is more tangible and thus gives us greater raw physical experience rather than it all, it all being emotional. Most of, our, most of our experiences are emotional and mental. They're not as physical. But I think that's why it's important for men to, do, to be involved in lifting or some kind of sport. Like I know a lot of guys are doing jujitsu and stuff now. That's cool. You, I don't think you can be a fully, I know you can't be a fully integrated man if it's not physical you have to do something it has to be material it can't just be uh, you know in my books and on my screens mm. uh, last week I, I went camping there's no phone service we, we found some random cave in the cliff we started a fire a guy cracks our steak puts it on top and there's something that i felt very deeply as like i'm away from all this fake cloud stuff you know like doing the podcast and doing remote work and mm. everything and it's like we just sat with a group of brothers, Christian brothers, I'd never actually met any of them before. And it was one of the most life-changing experiences of my life. And I was like, this is what we are built for. And we are so disconnected from this world. It's, it's absolutely unreal. Um, and yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a great shame that then we're sold that, you know, we're, we're confused in our identity. We're trying to find our way. And all these things are kind of fake problems, I guess. There's a political uh, science term called like post-materialism. And it's been quite yeah. widely studied. And now all the material things, we don't have to worry about a roof over our heads. We don't have to worry about food on the table. There's shops everywhere. We have abundance. Therefore, we don't really know what to do with ourselves because we're not having to do right. which is what you've just described. And that and so suicide rate is through the roof. And I think part of the reason why men kill themselves is because we don't have an end. We don't have a mission. We don't have a goal. Like there's nothing worthy to strive for together. And I think it's been a part of the enemy's plan as well, because if men are left to our own devices, we're problem solvers. And that means we're going to seek out problems. And if they don't keep us busy with, you know, being tax slaves or uh, watching pornography or smoking weed or, you know, worrying about whatever, like just all this vice and garbage, if they don't, if we're not occupied with that and we can communicate, we come together, we're a threat to the system. Men are, men are a threat to the system. Women don't, women don't uprise. Women don't create threats like that. That's not in their nature. So that's why you create, a, you create a, an environment where women can thrive and that men are subdued. Because the minute we become restless and we start to get together, like you and your, those guys that got together, that was cool. That was really cool because you got to have that bond and there's something that just a magical thing that happens with men when we when we sh suffer together, we struggle together, that's how we build bonds. But imagine like okay, you guys were hiking, so you had a destination and you had a goal, it was cool. But like if you had an enemy, <laughs> like a very physical and obvious enemy. And like you're not just bonding over steak in a cave. You're stalking, you're seeking, you're doing recon. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're 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 you have the survival of your people in mind with what you're doing. That would that tur that fire that you felt on the inside is turned up tenfold because now you have you have purpose and you have mission and you have valor, right? Because 
the, the man next to you sees how hard you're putting in you know, and, and what, what risks you're willing to take. And so then there's a sense of dignity and, and, and honor. All that virtue, it's, for the most part, it's like, you know, I'm exercising my virtue so I can make some internet dollars. It's like, what the f mm. Yeah, it was, it was such, a, such a powerful moment. I'm, I'm glad we got to reflect on that in, in the podcast as well. Um, some, some great words there. And just thinking about reflecting on where you've got to now, we've, we've spoken about what it means to be an integrated man and what it means to be in your life. And we've kind of reflected on, on some of those, those archetypes. Just thinking about the, the current state that is being attacked of masculinity, where we're being told that it's toxic and these expressions of traditional masculinity are kind of being stamped out. How do we strike the balance between being like overly aggressive and also being graceful? Because I, I, I remember seeing a, a reel of yours probably a few months ago now, where you basically said that um, you can, you can, what you're saying can be right, but the way you're saying it can be wrong. And I think that's quite a, it's quite an important point, especially when there's so many people on both the left and the right, if you want to talk politics or whatever, that just they're very dogmatic. They, what they could be saying is truthful. Like, do you know the Daily Wire? Uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've come across the Daily Wire. Um, like what, the, what they're saying, potentially there's some truth, but they're saying it in like an unloving way. And it's really challenging because when we look to Christ, for me anyway, that's, that's truth and love kind of perfectly combined. So like how, how do we kind of piece these two together? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm, of course, you reference Christ. What does he say? Be wise as a serpent, as light as a dove, something like that, right? It's like, yeah, I get that, right? Like, you don't back off like the serpent. You lay low, but you strike. You say what you have to say. You still inject your venom, right? But you make yourself sort of, you know, uh, not not a fighter, Right, like you're doing it, you're 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 doing it in a wise and congenial way. Ah, uh, I don't know, man, because I, like look at look at Andrew Tate, who's become like the most popular guy in like the quote unquote men's movement, right? And I don't watch him. I've seen a couple of his videos, and I know why men follow him because he's charismatic and he's got a big mouth. And he's willing to say hard things that need to be said. I mean, Christ did that too. He's, Christ, Christ said a lot of really based things. Like, how could you say that? And like, he just said it anyway. Like, he, but when he refers to himself as the son of man, I think a lot of times it kind of goes over our head. But it's a reference to Daniel, which is basically, he, that's when he's saying he's God. He's saying, son of man has no place to raise, lay his head. And back then, when people heard him say that, they're like, oh, you can't just go around throwing that word around. Like, you're claiming to be God. And so it's like, it's true, but it's gonna, and it might hurt your feelings, but it needs to be said. There was a couple other things. I was watching the the, uh, the the show with The Chosen, which I think is pretty cool. Some people have a problem with it. But there was a scene, I forget where he says, I don't remember what it was, but it was like so based, I had goosebumps. Like one of the Pharisees was asking him, you know, like uh, they were trying to like condemn him and maybe it was this where they were trying to condemn him. They wanted to push him off a cliff and like kill him. And he just like walks up to them and he's like, today's not the day. He just walks right by them. It's like, he, they, that was like, that, that was like a slap in their face. Or like when he was in the temple with them, just all these allusions to being God. Like he was ridiculous. He was incredibly based and would say things that he knew was going to piss people off in the name of truth and because of love. Right. So I think, you know, I brought up Andrew Tate that when, when people are so hungry for the truth and they see it in a, in a very um, contrasting way, like a, like a very uh, sensationalized way, it, it's like a wake-up call. It's like an alarm clock. I, like it, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't feel good. But it's like, damn, but I, I'm, I'm awake now. Like I needed to hear that. It's not, you know, I'm not putting myself in either of their categories, but I know a lot of videos I've made in the past, people, one of the comments that I would see repeatedly over and over again was, Elliot, I hated you when I first saw your videos. They hated me because of the way I was saying things that they didn't like what was being said. And of course, I, you know, I talk, I have a harsh tone to me. I just talk loud. But then 
I realized, you know, they were like, yeah, six months later, they come back and they apologize. And like, but then I realized you were right this whole time. I just wasn't ready to hear it. So, you know, we can get caught between this, like, I think I think I would err on the side of being too aggressive in this day and age than being too passive. Because we live, because everybody's trying to play nice. Everybody's Everybody wants to get along, to be, and this is the part of the gynocentrism, where if masculinity is going to make its way back, which it is, it's, you know, it's, it's God's plan anyway. Um, it's the guys who's, who talk loud, the guys who talk big, and Andrew Tate's, whether he's right or wrong, that are going to spark that masculine excitement in men. And they're like, whoa, okay, yeah, that's right. Feminism is from hell. Now I understand why. I'm happy someone's saying it. I think one of the things that immediately brought, sprung to mind when, when you said that is uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a meme that went around uh, probably a couple of years ago, and it's just out of a cartoon of Jesus. It's just like uh, they hated him because he said the truth. And it's like, that, that is so true. Like, if we think that Christ was, like, literally crucified for telling the truth and being this perfect man, like, how can we expect to be treated any differently when trying to live like Christ in a world which is so about the self and is so anti-religious and is all, all of these things? Um, but I suppose... Yeah. Would you say, would you agree with me if I said that Tate perhaps lacks, because um, obviously he's a, he's a fallible human as any of us are in contrast with someone like Christ. Um, but like, would you say that he, he someone like that and the, the quote unquote red pill movement and all this stuff, they, they lack the they lack the grace and they lack the love. And often what they say is, is hateful, even though it kind of comes across as truthful and, and brash. Would you? Would right. You yes, I do agree. And that's why I follow Christ because I have to ask myself at the end of the day like am I if, even if everybody hates me am I am I speaking what Christ would speak is this is this alignment with God through his son and his example and if it's not if I'm sinning or I'm causing people to sin or I'm getting causing them to turn away from the truth then I got to check myself even if I'm being nice even if I'm saying it nicely and everybody loves it if I'm causing them to sin and I'm damning their souls, I'm not doing the right thing. But if what I say hurts their feelings and they don't like me as a result, what Christ approves of it, and it's leading them to the salvation of their souls, even though you know I'm trying my best, maybe I could say it differently, then I'm satisfied. I could sleep at the end of the day. So what are some of the things that in the modern world you see are the most uh damaging to not not only young men but also young women obviously because it goes full circle because the how young men when men are affects then how uh, young women are mm -hmm. but what, what are some of the oh, most yeah. damaging and pervasive things that you would you would say um looking out yeah it's all inter it's integrated we're not alone men when women are not alone and we see what happened in the garden and we're just living the reverberation of the fall we literally are feminism started when eve didn't listen to her husband and took the bait of Satan. And so where are we today? Women are not listening to God the Father. They're not listening to their fathers. They don't have any fathers. And men are taking their bait. And the bait comes today, not in the form of a fruit from a tree, but it comes in the form of fornication and porn. And so men have literally put women on a pedestal and they follow and lead and live their whole lives so they can get some puss, literally. That's what most men's minds are at, and it's because of an unleashing of chastity. Imagine we lived in a world that didn't allow contraception because it was against the natural law and against God's law, didn't allow abortion, that, re that, was, that looked, looked, looked down upon fornication, right, where married, uh, sex outside of marriage. So, it, you know, it begins with this, it, become, it, it, it has to be a sexual dynamic issue. It can't be men by themselves because the fall of man is his following of women. And so that could come in the form of also pornography. Like a lot, that's the issue that I deal with the most in terms of the men that come and seek my guidance. 50% or more, they're losing their souls because they're watching screen sex. So it's, it's, it's sins, of the, sins of the flesh, sins of the flesh. And that's, that's uh, the sin that the Bible talks about fleeing from. It's not just that you don't do it. It's like flee from sexual immorality because it is so 
entwined with our nature. Like in, in God's design for sex, it's a beautiful, loving, intimate thing within the confines of marriage. But outside of it, it can be so destructive and it can be so hurtful for everyone involved. And I mean, I, I'm I'm baffled and I'm sure there'll be people listening to the podcast who don't share our views on this potentially, but but they're, they're trying to listen with an open heart because I've sent it to them because um, hopefully I'll, I'm so happy with this episode. I'm trying to, you know, share it with all my friends and stuff. And I know they'll be listening to this and potentially not agreeing, but I, and I see them at you know, you know university. It's almost celebrated and encouraged of like open sexuality and exploring your sexuality and all this deviance and stuff. And I, I find that just so odd that people can't see that you know there is the there is so many downstream damaging effects of how you view yourself and other people from it. Um, what are some of the things that you you tell these men then? Like, you know, you say it's one of the biggest problems, but how do you how do you help them out of it? Well, the, you got to understand that it is its root is feminism. And so you hear of all these guys, even Tate, right? These guys, they all talk shit about feminism, but it's like, but you're still promoting fornication. Women don't have power over men except through their pussies. That's it. They have no power over us at all. We're stronger than them. We have the faculties of man for leading the world are 10 times that of a woman. And it's not that we're better than them. They're designed to do something we can't, which is to bear and rear children, right? So we, we both have our gifts. But it becomes topsy-turvy, of course, in our world. You know that you, it's a slippery slope because now men are having babies. So you see where I'm going with this. It's a slippery slope from, oh, women should vote. I, I, this is, I know a lot of people that think this is crazy, but it's a slippery slope from let women vote to now men are having babies. It's a downhill slope. 100 years or less. And every society shows that. There's studies that have been done. I forget the name of the, uh, this guy who's, sorry, was it Glub? Um, man, I, I, I'm drawing a blank. But every society that's fallen has begun with when women get quote unquote liberation, which they never needed anyway, because they were always well cared for by the men in the world. Men love women. Husbands were always good to their wives. This whole idea that they were all they were beaded and mistreated, that's propaganda. That's propaganda. It's lies. Especially in, in Christendom, maybe in maybe in Islam or something like that. But Western civilization elevated women so much so that we have Mary, who is the most venerated woman. There are statues and paintings. The 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 Notre Dame Cathedral, all built off of a woman, all of Western civilization which is so patriarchal, is beauty is because of the inspiration of God's greatest creation, which is his mother. So to say that women were ever mistreated or poorly treated or like slaves is a complete lie and a denigration of what made Western civilization great. But if you're, if you're asking like what, the, what it ultimately is, what do I say to those guys? Well, if you hate feminism because you discovered the lie of feminism, which, which of course, I just exposed it, which is that women are somehow oppressed. They're not. Um, if you want to eradicate feminism, you got to understand that the number one weapon of feminism is fornication. Because when, when sex is outside of marriage, now women lead men. Men are the gate. Have you ever heard this? Women are the gateways to sex, of course. But men are the gateways to relationship. So if you put relationship in front of gate in, in front of sex, who is the real gate? Men are. But what we have now is the opposite. Women are the gateway to sex. We put sex first. So who is in charge? The woman. If men start saying no, I'm not. I'm not taking your bait. I'm vetting you to see if you're a worthy woman to live in this house with me. If you're going to be a good mother, you're going to be a good wife. You're going to be a good caretaker. You're going to be a good homemaker. I want to see if you're a worthy woman of my value as a man, because your pussy is just as warm as hers and hers and hers and hers and hers and hers. It's not that special. And so when men start valuing ourselves to such a degree that we don't need their sex, but they need our relationship, because women, as much as men, quote unquote, need sex, which I like to say, you know, God bless the man that doesn't need to blow his load, because that means you've got total self-control. If you're, if you're running around and your life is ruled by what you need to do with your dick, it kind of sucks. But women need relationships. 
They thrive in relationships. They're relational beings. They, their whole sense of self-worth is not, and as perverted as it is today, women still know this is why they lie about their, their notch count. It's not, the woman's worth is not from sex and how much sex she gets from man. That, lo- that lowers her worth. A woman's worth is de- demonstrated by her ability to keep a good husband, find and keep a good man. That's how you know it's a good woman. If she's been with a man that's a high value man for a long time, there must be something good there besides you know, the twat that she sits on. And so you know, that is a paradigm shift. Men, we have to realize that when we weaponize chastity, we take back our power as men. But as long as we're having sex with them, as long as we're paying only fans, as long as we're fornicating, as long as we're watching porn, they are going to rule the world. They're going to because they got you on a leash. Everything you said there. <clears throat> firstly, like thanks for sharing because I, I think you articulated it very well and it definitely resonates with me. But I think it speaks to the importance of because men are also you know innately flawed and sinful and um, are tempted by these things so much that we maintain something that sits above us, as in God so that we are God-fearing men, so that we keep to his word. Otherwise, we live in a world where we have figures, such as, you know, you you know, you could argue a Tate kind of last year and just generally Red Pill community in the manosphere who kind of say these good things about human nature, but then create the exact type of women that they they, they then kind of completely roast for sleeping around, even though they're sleeping around. And there's, they don't have control over their dicks, as you've, as you've described. And it's like, because they've taken self-ownership of what they, where they draw the moral lines. And it speaks to the importance of having objective morality in the form of an outside moral force, which is God, who's literally written the perfect moral framework in the Bible. And I think, right. you know, if more men return to that, as you've done, and as now you're encouraging people to do, and hopefully as, as I'm encouraging people to do, then we'd see a better world. But it's, you know, it's completely flipped on its head, as you've said. You know, people are rebelling completely the other way. And uh, we're seeing, well, I guess we're going to see, start seeing the fallout from that now in 10 oh, yeah. years, in 20 right. years. I mean, they're going to see this. We're going to see like in the next 10 years, the fallout with all these leftover women who are riding the cock carousel, but have no babies. It's going to be the most childless generation of women that we've ever seen. It's gonna, and I don't know what we're going to do with all these leftovers. The, 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 what, about, what value are they? What are they going to be middle managers? They're going to be checking groceries. <laughs> store like i don't get it what are you gonna do because no man's gonna marry and uh we're gonna have population collapse as well i suppose because <laughs> we're gonna have less and less kids and then at some point you know, but we're gonna well, have huge societal issues we need to be having kids are having kids right like traditional christians they're making babies we're being outbred by the muslims the only reason why islam is the fastest growing religion is because they didn't stop making babies because they never got fed the western lie that oh the world is overpopulated or you know, it's more economical to have less children. All those are lies in order to depopulate, mainly destroy Western civilization. And so considering everything we've spoke about, um, I'm conscious of time for, for both of us coming up. What are the ways in which we can communicate this sort of message to a world which is so diametrically opposed? Like how do, how do we package this message of, of biblical values and then how that cashes out as you know, gender dynamics, masculinity, like all, like all of the different issues. Um, <clears throat> and I want to preface this question for the, the listener's benefit as well, because uh, with something that I was speaking about with a friend last week, which is, you know, we were talking about on an individual case-by-case political basis. Say there's an issue such as, I don't know, abortion, transgenderism, all these like hot topics that are going off now. It's like, is there any worth in us debating those things if we don't you know, you know, surely those people aren't going to agree because their whole worldview is so different. And really, we need to be preaching the gospel to them. And then from the gospel, then it's kind of then those kind of later views and individual things get changed. So given that context, hopefully for, for the listeners as to where I'm at with this, how do we communicate um, this whole message that is so opposed to the world today? But remember how I said earlier that men learn by doing well, a part of learning by doing is watching other men do it. And so unless we see other men who are successful husbands and fathers raising families, really holy, healthy families, it's just a figment of our imagination. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to say, of course, by the grace of God, because by the grace of God, I came from an intact family with an alpha male dad and a mom, a woman who was amazing. By the grace of God, I met my wife when I was young and I, I repeated the pattern. I didn't know what I was doing, but I know God knew what he was doing because he knew at some point that there were going to be millions of men that follow me. And I'm, I'm very confident that I'm one of the only in this space that actually has a marriage to speak for when the world is all against marriage. The, all, like, they denigrate me. Most of my fans, they're like, I don't know, our marriage is terrible. It's a bad idea. And I don't blame them. I understand it's been denigrated. But, but the fact that they can see in me that it can work and it's a beautiful thing. I wouldn't want, my, I wouldn't want a different life. It's an amazing thing. Men need to be able to see that. And the only way they're going to see that is if you do it or if the next guy does it. And it's going to be harder for you to, than it was for me. Of course, you, it's a different generation. We didn't grow up with the internet. We didn't have OnlyFans. But the more they can see it actually working out for other men, it, the more obvious it will be to them that, okay, it's, it's actually possible. It can be done. Because they come from families with, that are broken. And, the, and we're about three generations in to the destruction of the family. So there are very few examples as far as spreading the message beyond just living it like I'm saying, that's by the grace of God. Because you could speak till you're blue in the face, but until the ears are open, epita, until those ears are open, no one, they can't, they can't hear you. And it's, it's God that opens their ears. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells in certain people. But like a ticking time bomb, they're just going to start popping up and they're waking up. I, see, I didn't see all this in YouTube, uh, you know, all these young men like yourself, this is a brand new thing. You know, there, I see, like, I think you mentioned David Ham Hammond, he's another young man. It's like, he just came out, like, in 2020, he said he started making his videos. It's like, you, you guys, your generation, like, all of a sudden, like, ears are opening up. And, you know, I, I attribute some, I give credit to Tate for some stuff, too, because it's like, for the first time, men are like, wait, feminism is not a good thing? So even though it's a clanging bell and a symbol and it's like, and he's saying some wrong things, it's like, but God has his reason why now is the time that a guy like that is waking people up. So it's out of our hands. It's totally in God's hands. And I'm, I feel hopeful because I see like, you know, we're having these conversations, you and me just, just doing this. And so it's happening, but it's not good enough that we talk about it. It's, they got to see it in practical action. Elliot, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. I've learned so much in the hour and 15 minutes that we've been recording. I hope that everyone listening uh, has also learned so much, but not just from you, but also who you point them to, right, in, in, in the foundation, in, in Christ and, and in the Bible. So um, mm -hmm. really appreciate you sharing your journey um, for spending uh, time with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Where can people find you if they would like to? Uh, follow you. Obviously. YouTube. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Google. I was just looking, I, I Googled myself today because I was trying to find a picture. I'm ever present. Or I'm omnipresent. There's a million images and videos of me. So it's, a, it's a silly question, really, isn't it? It's like, how can people find you? It's like, type in half of yeah, yeah. a couple, you couple of letters and it'll recommend <laughs> the rest. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. You want to find me? You'll find me. <laughs>